I'm sure that all of you who are listening there online are very interested in the same questions that our discussions are, are also. So the aim today is actually to talk about and figure out new questions and wonder about these themes together instead of finding very strict answers. This is the regulation, how it should be. Um, we have here people from industry, from consultancy, from Eco Confederation of, of Finnish Industries, which is like a wonderful name, <laughs> and, um, and uh, also uh, uh, companies. But I think that it's best that I let everybody present themselves more deeply, but just to go through the round table that we have here is we have Jared Luxton from EU, so one of our hosts from the host organization. Actually, I can tell you that he's one of the reasons that we even started this roundtable thingy because he thought that research is something that should actually be talked about also in the, in the business sphere. So we are mm. very happy to be here. Yeah. And you can tell what, what else you do normally when you are not uh, talking <laughs> around the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. And, 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 and then we have Marilena Makela, uh, who is a researcher in a Biodiful Research Consortium from New Vascula uh, School, of, uh, School of Business. And uh, she'll be sharing more about her background. Next to me is Minna Oyambera. And uh, I, she follows, uh, you have a fancy That's title. Right. So you have a fancy title that <laughs> you'll, you'll get around going through that. And you're from the Confederation, ECO for short. And then Sakari Suriniani from UPM. You also have an interesting firm name. It's actually United Paper Mills. Did you know that? <laughs> I'll turn back to after this today. And then Sara Asbel from Arla. Arla is easy. There we don't get mixed up with the names. And Otto Lappalainen, who is also a researcher in the same project from which Marilena and myself are coming from. So now I've told you your names, you remember them, and then you can tell what else it is that you're doing except for discussing here. Jared, yeah. please go on. Yeah, sure. So hi, everybody on the stream. Uh, my name is Jared Lux and I'm a manager in the sustainability team here at EY. And our mission at EY is to help support companies and organizations with their sustainability sort of ambitions and goals. Uh, now, an important part of that for me and for sort of many clients that we serve is biodiversity. And that's why we're here sort of talking about it today. Um, and the sort of focus of today's discussion about regulation is also very relevant for the type of work that we do. So figuring out um, what the requirements are, um, how that matches the different ambitions from companies and then how to do something about it. So I think it's going to be very interesting to hear the different perspectives from around the table today. Um, personally, my background is, is with uh, water and environmental engineering. So I'm sort of more on the technical side. And that's why I'm drawn to sort of more of these uh, sort of interesting di discussions about topics like, for instance, biodiversity. So hi from my side to the stream and to the panel guests, and I'm very much looking looking forward to having a discussion together. Hi, everybody. So my name is Marilena Makela, and I work as a senior lecturer in University of Jyväskylä in the School of Business and Economics. Um, I have worked for over uh, 20 years in academia focusing on sustainable business, so both doing research and teaching of those topics. Um, actually, also my background is in environmental engineering. <laughs> I have to Great. say that. Yeah. <laughs> engineer, so <laughs> like yeah. And uh, in this uh, beautiful project, I'll be especially focusing on corporate reporting on biodiversity. Yeah. Hello from my behalf also to the stream. My name is Minna Oyanperä and as you said, I'm from uh, Confederation of Finnish Industries. Eko. Eko, <laughs> if I say. And, um, I've been working for Eko one and a half years altogether in this in, in this area, uh, 12 years now. Previously I worked for forestry and agriculture. But I'm environmental lawyer. I'm, I'm glad to hear I, we have this um, Practical side as then this this theory side. <laughs> uh, I'm, as you may know, in Eco we have uh, a lot of different Finnish industry. Fifteen of them from construction, technology, mining, hospitality, textile and fashion, energy, food and drink, and and so on. And I'm coordinating all those sectors' own environmental. Uh, uh, specialties, but uh, to say what I'm actually doing, we are talking obviously our job is to talk to 
political decision makers and NGOs and government officials and I've been doing a lot of uh, a law drafting in different ministries but um, one and a half years ago we decided and that was my sort of task when I entered ECO was something new also for me to look into more more deeper to biodiversity and business because in ECO they felt that they haven't actually looked uh, enough of this phenomena because climate issues are very much everywhere at the company's tables but biodiversity is approaching and they wanted that there's also people in ECO to help companies to understand it and to explain what to do. Mm. So that's basically my job. Yeah. And Zachary. Yeah, re really happy to be here to, today with you to discuss about the biodiversity. And maybe I might shortly introduce the company for which I'm, I'm working so you understand which is the perspective that I, I, I'm looking at the biodiversity and the related regulations. So, so I guess UPM is for the Finnish audience pretty well known, but for the international audience probably you don't recognize the name because we are not a consumer, consumer brand, but the, uh, our business is mainly business to business. So, but we are anyway, we are a major uh, forestry company. Uh, our main products are paper, pulp, plywood, timber, biofuels, biochemical, self-adhesive self labels, energy, and of course all those except energy is, is based on, on wood. So the, raw, the main raw material is, is wood for, for those and, and of, of course it's pretty obvious what's the link from the wood sourcing and, and forestry for the, for the, mm -hmm. for the biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Our, we have uh, four uh, production bases, one in, in, in Finland, Central Europe, one in Uruguay and, and one in and Minnesota, US. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, my role is then to work in the, in the sustainable wood sourcing and, and forestry. Of course, I'm not the only person working for, for that in, at UPM. We have a, a quite a lot of people working, working for that, but my responsibility is to, uh, to work with the uh, main global certification teams, namely the FSC and, and BFC, uh, develop different sort of partnerships with our stakeholders, and, the, and of course, uh, follow and understand the different sort of uh, frameworks that are the global frameworks that are under, under development. For example, the, the science based target network is, is really interesting and, and something that we are we are following and actually part of also the, the corporate engagement program. So this is something that is on, on, on my table. Interesting. And then we have our second business <laughs> <laughs> participant, Sara. Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Sara Asdal and I come from Arla Finland. Uh, so Arla Finland is a subsidiary of uh, Arla Foods, a, a group uh, based in Denmark. So we are, of course, uh, the link to biodiversity is pretty clear as well for us as we are producing food that comes from, from nature. So uh, in Finland, we have close to 400 dairy farms that are supplying milk to, to Arla Finland and and my job is then uh, to, to develop and coordinate what we do in terms of sustainability locally with a lot of focus on the concrete actions and, for example, how we can uh, promote biodiversity at Arla Finland, but also together with the dairy farmers. Yeah. And then last but not least, Otto. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Otto Lappalainen and I'm from the Finland Future Research Center, which is part of the University of uh, Turku. And uh, like Mila said, um, I'm one of the researchers of this, of this project that has uh, gathered us here today with EU. And um, yeah, in our, with our research uh, research group, we are studying the societal side of the biodiversity crisis and how we can um, handle it. And we have, for example, been uh, been studying why it is that our society has so far failed to halt biodiversity loss. And for this, we have, uh, for example, studied the root causes of um, biodiversity loss in Finnish forests. And uh, maybe more re relevant to this, uh, this discussion, we are also um, uh, studying what can we as a society do to combat this uh, biodiversity crisis. And, and for this, we have, for example, um, studied all kinds of uh, policy measures and uh, policy instruments. Uh, such as um, regulation, legislation, um, changes in uh, governmental structures, uh, informational and uh, educational measures, and, and such. So it's a, it's a it's a quite a, quite a large uh, um, team for for us. And uh, happy to be here today discussing with you. And hopefully we get also some great ideas for. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, that's a promise. <laughs> Philosopher's Stone, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we're talking about regulation. That's like the core theme today. Biodiversity is everything that all of us do. But today we're thinking about uh, regulations, not so much about what's actually in the contents of them, but a little bit what should be, what are the principles and what are the potential impacts. But uh, first, I'd like to know from, from Sara and Sakari, uh, because you're working in, in companies, uh, what types of regulation or regulation frameworks or or guidelines or uh, or such are you working mostly with? Which are the ones that that you are dealing with uh, uh, the national or international level? So I don't know if you want to start off. Yeah, yeah, I can go first. Uh, yeah, of course, part of my job is then to to kind of be aware, especially locally, of what are the stakeholder expectations and. Uh, Maybe more broadly, also the societal expectations towards towards our sustainability work. So, so in that sense, the regulatory frameworks and, and legislation that applies is relevant to, to to what we do and how how we do things. And it there's of course the kind of the existing legislation which sets the baseline, and then you can start to build sustainability on top of that. But then the kind of legislative initiatives that come, they they give the direction as well to where where is this build heading and what we should take into account in the future. But I guess uh, there's a lot of different regulations out there when it comes to sustainability and biodiversity as well. And, but uh, I think the kind of uh, international frameworks, best practices, science based targets network and such things which have proven to be quite successful in the climate side. So those are very relevant, uh, at least for, uh, for us locally, but also at a kind of global route. Yeah, I guess I have a pretty similar story than, than, than Sarah. So of course, there's, there's a, a strong regulatory framework governing the, the forest practices in Finland. There's tens of different laws that are somehow impacting the, the forest practices. Of course, if you think about the biodiversity, the Forest Act from the, I think from the from the 96 is the most important, especially the section 10, which says which are the, the, the special habitats that you always have to protect in the, in the commercial forests. So of course, that's uh, like if from the existing regulation, something that they have to, of course, uh, uh, follow. And, and well, maybe I, I, I say something about that. Uh, because it's interesting, like from the in the in the factories where you have a very standardized conditions, it's maybe a bit easier to follow the, the, the regulations and laws. But like the forest, every forest is unique. And when you have to, uh, the, the law says that you have to preserve the, uh, the natural characteristics of these specific types like springs and, and, and my habitats and, and rivers uh, and, and brooks, for example. So we really have to have a strong expertise for all the hundreds of people, our own people and the current contractors who are working in the in the forest. So it's a lot of education and, and constant training for our people. And of course, we have to have a center of expertise that we can really meet the, meet the regulation. So that's like the existing work that has been already going on, on for decades. But then when 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 about the, uh, the about, about the anticipation about the future regulation, if you think about the uh, the global regulation, for for example, so or the EU regulation, the, so the EU deforestation uh, regulation, which is now now soon upcoming. So that's of course very uh, interesting for, for us, which we are, are, are following closely, and, and also the, the global biodiversity framework that was. Uh, accepted there in, in, in Montreal. That's not a regulation yet, but it's a framework that will, will potentially then impact on the on the local local regulation. So those are of course that something that we are uh, we are we are following. Are those the ones that you deal with mostly with your customers? Which are the I mean, uh, you have this cross cutting view yeah. of what types of regulations and also mean like you want are these uh, the science based targets and they. Montreal decision that they are the ones that people are waiting for. Yeah, maybe I can I can just jump jump in there. It's very interesting to sort of hear hear the hear the perspectives. I think one of the big changes that's I think hit in the in the last couple of years on the corporate level is the there's the the new uh, CSRD, which is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is changing the game for how companies have to report on sustainability. Um, bi biodiversity and ecosystems has its own standard built into that. And I think that has been quite uh, a bit of a shake up for people that maybe not have or their sort of companies haven't had to consider biodiversity with such a strong lens previously. And now it's it's sort of being pushed through by the by the EU. So I think that that on one side would be so definitely something that I think has is creating a change within the within the industry. But that is more of um, 
that's sort of what needs to be the end result. Uh, those reg those regulations don't give you much in terms of how to get there. <laughs> um, and I think that's where these sort of frameworks that we're talking about come into play. So some that would, that, that I would name is the science-based targets for nature is obviously a framework that's being developed globally, um, but also the TNFD, so the, the task force for nature-based financial disclosures is a key framework that's being used, not just in Europe actually, but globally for companies to help actually deal with the how, how do we address this? So I think there's kind of two elements that people should kind of be aware of is the fact that there's regulations coming down to sort of set out what must be done. And then there's also frameworks that are coming out to sort of support and say, how do you get there? Sort of not just communicating the end result, but also some pathways to actually progress. Yeah, if I may, may shortly comment, I, I think it's uh, important that we, we don't have a, let's say, a, a, a global regulation that strictly says how it has to be done on, on the local conditions, because that when it comes to biodiversity, that's that's, I would say, impossible because the biodiversity, those issues you have to solve locally. Like you, you can set the ambition level globally, but then really how to get there, of course, it has to be adapted on the local conditions because it's everywhere the, the conditions differ and you have to have the, have the right, right measures for the for, for, for right, for right challenge. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All of this sounds very familiar. Maybe from my view, when, when you're working for, in ECO, so we are looking at the environmental regulation at the international level. We were with Zachary, we traveled to Montreal for the Biodiversity Convention. Obviously, we have a very much work in EU. EU is our most important legislation in environmental policy nowadays and has been always. But obviously, also, I'm working closely with the governments, but also municipal land mm. use and planning. So, all the levels. Not so many in my table are the frameworks, they are mostly company based, but I think you just nail it. But usually legislators do, they, they give the, the, the clear vision and the year where it has to be something done, but not the actual steps. And with the biodiversity, I think that's why there's so much fuss in, in companies because people don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. And you said that in forestry sector, you have been here for for decades now. You have the expertise, but mostly companies, they don't still have enough people to dig into the, mm -hmm. the very, very critical issues that, that, that affects them. And, and I think that's the big change that's happening now. How are the, these regulations viewed in companies? Are they like, well, you've learned to live with them in the forestry. Basically, sustainability as a concept came from forest care in the 17th century. So, so forests have for long, people have understood that if we want to have wood, then we have to have forests. <laughs> we have to take care of them. So you're you're learning to live with them. Uh, but in your perspective, and also in Arla, you're dealing with soil and uh, farmers and the basic agriculture. So there are these. But but how is this regulation we viewed in companies? Uh, any of you who are dealing with companies can 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 answer this question. Is it something that, yay, now they're giving us frameworks how to do the right things and where we should aim at? Or is it like, well, this is unclear. Could you could you please clarify? And is it is it helpful in any way? In, or how what's the general attitude towards the regulations in the business field? Anybody who dares to yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe I can, I can stand, but then, 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 then. I would say it's a little bit of everything. So of course it's important, like that, that there is a, a global regulation. It's it's leveling the playing field for everybody. So that it's the same rules so that, that nobody is getting, for example, economic benefits by by destroying nature. So of course it's good for the for the front runner companies as well that there is a, a certain criteria. Uh, but, but, of course, at the same time, it might be also a challenge because it's not so clear and, and obvious how to meet the, meet the requirements of the um, of the of the uh, regulation. Like for example, now the, the upcoming EU DR uh, regulation. It's a uh, well, I was mentioning the Forest Act earlier. It's really really clear the impact of the Forest Act on the, on the nature. It's really like you you have to preserve these specific biotopes. It's really like the the, the the impact is on on the nature, but then in the EU DR in in Finland, for example, there is not because we don't have a uh, the deforestation is not an issue in Finland. So that so there is not so much work that has to be done on the field, but there is quite a a, a big layer of additional 
uh, let's say bureaucracy needed so that we can build the system so, so that we can meet the uh, requirements for the verification and geolocation that is needed uh, to pass that information all the way from the from the forest to the to the to the end user. So so yeah. of course it's a, it's a both good and great thing, but it's also a, a providing a, a challenges. And of course, it's a, companies are looking at the cost. So of course, it's a cost to build a, mm. a, a, a additional systems and, and build build more bureaucracy. So it has to be a balance. Yeah, you said uh, we don't have deforestation. And uh, I should mention to the customer, uh, to the viewers that uh, there are two different things, forest loss and deforestation and biodiversity loss. So yeah. while we do have a lot of forest, it is quite biodiversity poor. So, so uh, obviously you have to take care of not only the fact that there is lumber and timber, yeah. but there is also biodiversity. And I, I think that's an additional layer of, of, of things that you have to consider. But Otto had a question there. Yeah, uh, just a comment on, on the deforestation law. Uh, I, I think it's uh, the good part of this kind of regulation is that it, it, it shifts responsibility from con consumers to, to those who are producing. So, so in the future, uh, consumers can can rely on that the products that they're buying in the EU single market area have, are not causing uh, any de deforestation. So, so I, I think that kind of regulation is is very important in, in that case that it, uh, it that uh, what the consumers are doing is becoming automated and uh, it, it doesn't require extra thinking of whether this is a better product in in terms of deforestation or, or, or that one is. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Marilena and then Jared. Yeah, so if I would bring a kind of a perspective from the academia to this discussion, and if you if you look at a definition definition of, of sustainable business, and then quite often we, we see that it's about the uh, economic, environmental and social aspects or impacts that the company is causing. But then kind of what is interesting, if you look at the definition, how to define sustainable business, it's, it's quite often that the researchers emphasize on the voluntary actions what the companies take. So basically kind of regarding your question mm -hmm. about the, the legal requirements, are they good or bad mm -hmm. in a way, is that uh, if we just focus on that companies are fulfilling the legal requirements, then we are not kind of, we are not kind of talking about sustainable business. So in, in my, my work, I don't focus on that whether or not the companies are meeting the, the legal requirements. So kind of that they would need to do something extra. And then we are looking at kind of the extra actions that how they are, what kind of more they are doing based on the legal requirements. But, but kind of if, if, when we start to talk about the um, biodiversity regulations, I kind of do see their, their value that we, we also need very strong um, legislation in this field because we see that the voluntary actions we haven't done that well mm -hmm. in the past. Jared had a one. Yeah, I think just getting back and to that point about sort of how the topic of biodiversity is being received, I think because it's a complex topic and that the, the word biodiversity packs in a lot into it when you say it, it also creates some uncertainty and maybe some sort of feeling of unease within companies that aren't used to dealing with this with this topic. And I think uh, that has, that can sort of be difficult to overcome because I think there is a, a gap of the current expertise that many companies have in this area to be able to understand and then sort of implement the necessary actions. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a real that's a real challenge. And it's something sort of the sort of we uh, try to help with. But I think in in a in a general level. Um, there will be an increase sort of in capacity, I think, for companies in, on this topic going going forward to be able to meet the demands, not only maybe of the sort of requirements, but also ambition levels that are being that are being set uh, to actually get those actions moving on on the ground. So I think that it's it's challenging because it's a reasonably new topic for many, mm. and that's that cre creates sort of feelings of unease, I think. Yes. Otto, you had a yeah, kind of returning what uh, what Marilena said uh, said about strong regulation. I, I also think that, that the upside of uh, upside of uh, strong regulation is that uh, it, it sets the it sets the minimum high, mm -hmm. and with weak regulation, the minimum can be low, and um, sometimes the minimum can become the maximum for for uh, for many for many actors. And with, with if you have uh, like a strong base rules for 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 everyone, uh, then we could like shift the minimum up also and it's it's not just just the forerunners who are doing things. Yeah, I had a, a comment on kind of coming back to how to get there and kind of uh, not also waiting for the 
perfect legislation in a way, but uh, at least how we see that it's important to start to act, even though we don't know know everything that's out there and we don't know all the details. We don't know maybe what's the best measurement framework to do this and that, but but to start to work on that. And I think that's where also the, the kind of industry collaboration can be very helpful. For example, in the, in the food industry in Finland, uh, there's currently a work ongoing to set the kind of biodiversity roadmap, what could be the targets, what could be the best practices, what could be the ways to measure that. And I think that's helpful for companies to, to discuss these together and kind of try to try to define these uh, best ways forward, also considering the fact that the impacts will be a bit different uh, from industry to industry, but also from location to location. Mm -hmm. So then there will be a work to do for all companies, but then these shared uh, forums where we create a bit of maybe best practices, I think those can be really helpful. Yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you and then you and then me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about the regulation and and do we have enough of it or or why haven't we solved the problem? And that was a very good question that we should obviously ask. But if we think back of maybe five years, I think European Union woke up to this quite a bit loss with the Green Deal framework, mm. and there has been quite a lot of regulations, and I ask our member organizations, for example, food and drink uh, Finland or, or co commerce industry of Finland, uh, they always said that, well, also financial institutions are part of ECO, so they mostly always said that, yes, there's a lot of taxonomy, a lot of reporting that hits the financial wave, so to speak. Then we had the biodiversity uh, targets, natural restoration, low deforestation, and so on. And also in Finland, we have this Nature Con Conservation Act and ecological offsetting, and so, so on. Uh, I think there's a lot of going on, and now companies are saying that maybe we should give it for a few years to see how it's implemented, because it always takes time when the law is accepted. It's not like next day, it's like so <laughs> it takes takes few years, and I think we now there has been some new regulation, and now maybe we should be more patient now and see how it affects. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I was kicking you. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like, no, I, I like what Marilena said, and I'd like to con continue on that. So about the the voluntary actions of the companies. We are today we are speaking about the regulation, but like if you really want to gain competitive advantage from your biodiversity actions. And then, of course, it's not enough that you follow the regulation and, and then you are ha happy with that level. So, of course, then you have to go beyond. The forest certification seems, for example, they are an, uh, a good example of that. So you, you go, I was mentioning the forest tag, but in the in the Finland, in the, in the certification systems, you set the bar much higher with, with those uh, with those certification schemes. And now there is the science-based target uh, network that is mentioned here many times already. So this is, all, again, a one voluntary seem that might set the bar, bar much higher than the current regulation is is, is uh, requiring. So that's like what the front running companies are, of course, of course, following. And if, if you really want to get the from the investors, from from your customers, you the, 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 let's say the, the competitive advantage. So then you have to look, look mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. It's interesting what you said about the front runner companies that, that because uh, uh, on the one hand, it can be first mover advantage. You can really get the benefits out of this, but but I have to share with you a story of uh, uh, one of our network uh, members who has a farm and he had been uh, participating in a forum where there were these uh, European wheat buyers who were discussing the price of wheat. And there was one big uh, buyer for a big company, which I won't name, and who said that, well, it's too bad if you have more regulation than others and your wheat is too expensive. We just go where it is cheapest. And yes, we know that the regulations are going to change, but as long as we can get it cheap, then we'll buy it cheap. And then when the regulations come, then we'll just, you know, figure out something else. So, so not only is there the front runner advantage, but also it gives the maybe less moral companies the uh, ability to sort of try to find the one where the, the yeah. regulation is, is weakest. Have you encountered this phenomenon? What should one do about it? I, I think that your field is sort of closest to it because in, in Scandinavia, the uh, basic production is quite highly regulated. You know, how, do, how, how can you actually grow wheat, for example? So it tends to be a bit more expensive than the one that is outsourced from 
Asia maybe somewhere. So so how are how how do you view this sort of predatory behavior in terms of from the buyers? Because you also represented the buyer. So do you see this phenomenon? Well, I I would kind of start from go back to the fact that it when you know, in a way as a sustainable if as a company who wa wants to operate sustainably, we of course want to comply with the legislation and uh, and we see it as a also developing our sustainability as a way to to be there for the future to to create the mm -hmm. sustainable food stuffs and then then of course it's up to the buyers to to kind of choose what they see that fits their their needs. Yeah. Mm. Maybe I could yeah, comment yeah, on yeah. that one. I think it's really interesting too because as someone who hasn't sort of grown up inside of the EU, it's also a really interesting mechanism to see how this sort of one market system can actually assist in this because it means that there's a lot more bargaining power within Europe rather than, for instance, Finland having to try to go it alone, if you will, on, on some of these more difficult challenges when there's sort of global competition. So I think the sort of minimum bar that's being set currently with the EU is, is actually trying to address some of these things. And if you dig into some of the regulation that's coming from the EU, it's very value chain focused. And it's it's sort of forcing many companies for the for the first time to really go deep down the value chain and then companies that are also sourcing materials um, from sort of outside of the EU area or, for instance, that operate outside and then selling within. They are also having to con sort of consider these different uh, issues. And one thing that I'll flag is I think there's many questions that are that are sort of coming to companies that maybe don't have uh, the biodiversity legislation applying to them directly but part of their value chain does, and it's going to affect them indirectly. So I think there's quite a lot of scope actually when, and as you said, I mean, it takes time for these things to sort of come into play, but when they are fully developed, I think there is quite a lot of scope for even those companies that might not be the forerunners or might not be um, pushing the agenda internally, they, they will be affected indirectly. Okay. Yeah, I think it's great that you brought up uh, value chains uh, because I, I, in, in terms of regulation, I think it's it's important that uh, the whole chain is uh, included in, in, in the regulation and in demands because, uh, for example, like um, like farmers who are many of them are struggling and there's new demands coming. It's 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 just not fair if they take all the responsibility and that they have to do everything, everything correctly and, mm. and, and then uh, Take, take the whole burden mm. of uh, regulation. Mm. Yeah, um, I will be repeating myself of <laughs> what I said about kind of raising the bar. Kind of, so if the minimum level is kind of high enough, then we wouldn't have the problem with you asked that they are only able to focus on the money or the economic side. Or how much does it cost and forget uh, how bad it has been for the environment or what kind of social impacts there has been? Yeah. yeah. I was wondering what you said about uh, the voluntary and that you were saying that when when if their uh, companies can move, move quite fast when they want to do something good, whereas what you were saying that it takes some time for the legislation to come there. So so sometimes one hears that that actually the most efficient and, and effective way to make this world of ours sustainable would be to uh, rely on the voluntary actions of companies that are kind of faster movers. Whereas uh, what I'm saying on the legislation side, that's kind of raising the bar to a minimum level so that nobody nobody harms it. So there's this uh, legislation part, this mandatory part, and then there's this uh, effective uh, competitive cooperation part. Um, which one do you believe? I'm sure it's not that black and white. I think we need all, but 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 yeah, Marilena. Actually, I would like to turn this question to, to Sakari because when I was doing my, my doctoral uh, research on forest industry and that environmental reporting, many of the experts who I interview said or named as a very like a very positive story, as a success story of the Finnish forest industry, uh, what you have been doing regards with the um, um, impacts on water or water systems. So although kind of there has been the legislation asking of the forest industry companies to to uh, cause less uh, environmental impact in in waterworks, but still kind of you also have had a kind of a voluntary action that kind of you haven't only focused on the minimal level, but you have done more. So 
I'm kind of tossing the ball around. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the for the for the, for the positive uh, yeah. feedback. Yeah, so yeah, like you said, I think it's not not so so black and white, but it's 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 both. So of course we need we need regulation to to push the companies and, and push the whole whole society to to move forward. So so there has to be has to be that there has to be the voluntary actions. But of course, like the companies, well, of course they they, they have their own policies. That, like they they voluntarily do good things, but of course. We also respond to the pressure we receive from the, from the outside society, like our in investors, like the customers, like the like the NGOs. Of course, they also have in the in the past. Like you can admit that they have played a significant role on putting pressure on the company. So there, we we really have had the, the voluntary actions and, and the uh, the society around us and the regulation have supported us. So that then that, that that has been the combination that have made us to to, to improve. Yeah, if I can yeah. just actually it's. Good, Sakarian, that you brought that up because uh, one year ago we we sent uh, we wanted to ask our member organizations companies, which are about fifty thousand of them in ECO, about biodiversity and biodiversity loss. It was mm. the one thing to ask certain questions from them is just to give a notice that, by the way, there's this issue now in also in ECO. And one of the questions was that. Uh, uh, have you woken up to the biodiversity loss and will it affect your business? And what are the pressure to do so if you if you already have? And the question uh, answer was that mainly because of consumers and customers. That those were the main drivers for the for the companies to to do something if haven't done already. And then came uh, government officials or, mm. or regulation. But it was the because it was like you said. Uh, it wasn't that clear to me before, mm -hmm. but nowadays it's it's yes. it's true. And also, also the pressure on the society and the discussion that's happening on the news and so on. It was also the entire time. Yeah, I have a comment on that uh, mandatory versus uh, voluntary discussion. Uh, I think we need kind of a mix of both uh, because uh, uh, we could uh, put environmental harm and uh, the cost of externalities into the prices of commodities, and that would uh, kind of uh, bring the competitive advantage to those 400 companies automatically. And it would also mean that uh, the customers would see, would be able to see see the um, effects of, of the products they are buying. Uh, of course, for this, we need a lot of things to happen. We, we need to, we need ways to like effectively measure biodiversity and uh, which is of course uh, bringing down to one number or couple of numbers is very difficult and uh, also there's some like ethical considerations but if we could get uh, everything into the price system we could actually do a lot of things and then the system would kind of start to guide itself towards uh, what are uh, more sustainable yeah 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 I think it's it's sort of maybe following on from that, but I'd just like to draw the parallel to sort of the also the issue of climate, which has been sort of maybe more, it's more mature within sort of corporate world at least, and it's been dealt with for a, for a longer time. Uh, I think there will be one additional driver that will start to come forward sort of in addition to regulation and then con consumer preferences, which I think is sort of business to business pre like preferences, because as has been seen in climate, when companies are, are sort of needed to report then their sort of scope three emissions, it then brings into focus sort of where you source your materials and sort of what your suppliers are doing. And I think as biodiversity matures, and we get further down the and we sort of develop the ability to assess our scope three bi biodiversity footprint, if you will, then I think companies will start to ask the question when they're buying products or services about the sort of biodiversity or sort of nature footprint. So I think it's maybe not here yet, and I don't think that sort of pressure is really moving at the moment, but I foresee that actually in the next five to 10, 10 years as a driver that will that will become stronger within the market. Yeah. You had a word to yeah, yeah, I think I wanted to continue on what, what Minna said about the, about the public pressure. Like, of course, everybody knows that in, in, in Finland that the forest industry has been under the loop for, for decades. Like, everybody has an opinion on how the forest should be should be managed in, 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 in Finland. So, of course, that has really pushed us to, to improve. That has been a, a significant factor on that. So it's not enough that we, we, we follow the, the, the regulatory baseline, but we have to go much beyond that and find out the, the voluntary ways of doing it. and and, and 
about which is better the regulation or the voluntary actions or like we are not really like waiting the the, the uh, regulation to fix the issues for us but we are really looking uh look, looking all the time the actions that we can do to improve our operations and we really believe that we have we are able to uh, capable of, of developing methods and tools for the for the forest management in Finland how we can how we can best manage the the, the nature also in the commercial forest Sorry, but yeah, just wanted to to echo the fact that this the kind of customer consumer pressure is really what's also driving it for for us as well. And we are already having the discussions with our customers on how to how they are working on biodiversity, how we are working it, how do we see it going forward, and what we could maybe do together in terms of the you mentioned the scope three of nature in a way. So so that is that is really there and and. In, in a similar way, we are working with our, our scope three, which is then the dairy farms and and what can happen there. And of course, they they based on the we've done some di biodiversity assessments already at the farm to give a kind of farm level uh, roadmap on where they can improve and and it shows that they, the farms can also have a positive effect. So there's this mm -hmm. both both sides of the coin, and to be more aware of that than what we can do to to further improve the outcome. So mm -hmm. that is something that we we are focusing on. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for our business participants. Um, you, you talked before that you're preparing for future regulation. Uh, I, I was, uh, I'm interested to hear uh, what kind of timescales are you using and uh, how much into the future are you looking at and, um, and, uh, and um, how much of your work is, is it to, to prepare for the future actually? Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. Where is uh, your future? <laughs> yeah, our future. Uh, that's a difficult one. For, what to say? Like, of course, we are like a big companies like us. We are following the development of the of the of the regulation. Like, I'm not the regulatory expert as such. So, of course, like everybody knows, that big companies have public affairs teams who are following the the, the regulation and uh, very very close. So, of course, we are we are looking like always when the the, the process of developing a new re, uh, regulation is initiated. We are we are following and somehow participating in the in the process. But when it comes to the implementation, so then we have to really wait until we know what what is really expected and what we have to do. So, for example, when it comes to this EU DR, EU deforestation regulation, which is coming uh, pretty soon. Uh, so, but we are still, of course, we are already working on it. We are really studying it, analyzing what we have to do. But we are still kind of waiting. Uh, let's say to understand what's really expected before we start building our our system so that we really then once we build it it's not cheap cheap so once we build it it really mm. responds to the, yeah. the, to the requirements yeah. of the regulation I'm, I'm also interested like are you preparing for the unknown as well uh, you, you told about you you care about uh, new regulation being initiated but do you have like a like an overall vision on where are you going like 20 <laughs> years from now or something. Yeah, is it about waiting for the yeah. regulations or is it about you know yeah. driving the change? So yeah, is it reactive it or is, yeah, yeah, if it is driving, where are you driving it towards? Yeah. yeah, yeah. When it comes to the biodiversity in Finland, for example, so we have like in 98 we launched the biodiversity program and, and a few years back we, we launched the biodiversity indicators. So for example, we have nine biodiversity indicators for the Finnish forestry. So that's kind of our vision. What are the indicators we want to follow? And, and what we think are the, the, the criteria, for example, in Finland, which we want to develop. So that's the, the kind of our vision for the Finnish forests, for for example. I don't know if that responds to your question, question at, at all. I, I think this is interesting because now we've been talking about responsibility and you see often that it's one of those things that keeps uh, being shuffled to different participants depending on who's talking. So it's not me, it's somebody else. When it's company, it's a consumer who we're listening to. If it's a consumer, consumers say that, well, companies just sell us nice things so we buy them and when it is policymakers it's like well uh, policymakers uh, say that well it's the voters who should be voting you know the right policymakers there so so it responsibility is something that seems to be sort of shuffled around depending on where one is but now when I listen to this it seems that also the visions the future visions are something that are being sort of shuffled that that what would a biodiversity world look, uh, biodiversity respectful world look like, and who should be in charge of making those visions? Is it companies, or are you just waiting for regulations? Is it is it consumers who should sort of uh, push for uh, different types of, or is it policymakers? Is it anywhere in the processes of those policymakers? So so 
who should be doing these visions that that we should all be aiming at with the regulations? Anyone can be. Parilla. We are doing that in the biological project. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but We're apart not. from us. <laughs> I think this should be uh, put in the in the global level in, in, in the UN Convention of Biodiversity, which what happened in Montreal. So the target now is 2030 mm -hmm. to halt biodiversity loss and then to reverse it. So that is the goal now. And that the sad part is, as you said, why why have we why have we been failing? Because the goal has been 2010, 2020, and now 2030. But mm -hmm. I think that's the common goal for everybody who signed it at the Montreal mm -hmm. last December. And also uh, Finland is uh, uh, with it. Yes. And I, I guess like to say it very simply, of course, the, the aim is, for example, with our net positive impact is to uh, to stop the biodiversity loss. That's mm -hmm. that's like yeah. the, the vision yeah. in the most simply mm -hmm. said. Of course, then there has to be actions on the on the, on the run, but that's on, on a very high level. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think we are kind of missing the public discussion on uh, on what our society is going to be look like, like mm -hmm. in, in 20 years or 30 years from now and how 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 can we live in a sustainable way. What what are uh, what do our professions look like? How do we consume things? Uh, of course, there's like research and such, but uh, you don't really see that in in like newspapers or or even uh, election panels. Uh, like just a few weeks ago, there was very few like overall visions of leading politicians on on what, what are we going to. Well, yeah, Marilena, then Sakari, Chadat. What was it? Yeah, what are you? If I may just oh, <laughs> uh, on the kind of who should do the global mm -hmm. missions, I, I think we should also trust the scientists to do that. I guess all the, all the information does not live, for example, within uh, within our land. <laughs> we don't have the information or where where the world is going and what are the scenarios based on the current scientific data we know. So I think that's a good good starting point that mm -hmm. then. Uh, coming back to when you asked about the kind of horizon of, of mm -hmm. planning, I think at, at least, uh, of course, we are looking into what's happening uh, globally, these uh, 2030, 2050 targets, whatever they may be, and, and trying to kind of uh, figure out how will that yeah. impact our work. But then the planning horizon might be from one year to three years to five years. So, so we know the world is changing really fast, so I don't think, or well, at least we don't do class for 20 years, so, okay. yeah. so that's a bit hard. Yeah, yeah. but I think Marilena and Gerald, Minna. Let's do that, ladies. Marilena. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, I would like to talk more about uh, the future, or futures, mm -hmm. as kind of, um, what I didn't mention as my, as my background is that I used to work in the Finland Futures Research Center, and what I especially like on future studies is the concept of futures images that we would mm -hmm. kind of uh, make descriptions of the possible or the alternative futures what we have. Kind of in future studies, we, we talk about futures we don't have just one future mm -hmm. ahead of us, but there are currently there are multiple of those. And depending on the actions what we take today, that will then shape the future what we we are facing or, or will be having. So in that sense, kind of we would really need to have more of that kind of a discussion in in the society, also in companies, but also in in in, in like I don't know news and and stuff like that, so that it would make it evident for us that what kind of a decisions we all in in our daily life, so in in the workplaces mm -hmm. at home, what we need to take in order to reach a future that would be nicer, regardless uh, regarding uh, biodiversity, environmental issues, social issues, and and so on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think when we're talking about these sort of scenarios, we're always talking about some sort of uh, sort of positive change, right? Or, I mean, it can also be negative, but in, 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 the, in the positive sense, positive change. And I think that's also been a slight transformation and, and at least something that sort of I always try to emphasize when working with this issue is it's not just about risks. We aren't only talking about risks. The global biodiversity framework has set a really high ambition and sort of notified the governments and different sort of financing around the world will be directing finance towards this issue, which means that there's really opportunities here too. And I think that's how we start to move towards actually some of these positive scenarios rather than just trying to sort of conserve and reduce impact is also recognizing some of the opportunities that exist. And I think that's been a it's in process, but I think we're starting to get there with the sort of companies and 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 especially here in here in Finland, I think there are some 
real leaders with that. But looking towards where where can we make our competitive advantage built around either the topic of biodiversity or something similar. But that is, I think, something that will only grow. Yeah, yeah. discussion is. Uh, I, I think it's too much about uh, what's it going to be costing us <laughs> instead of uh, what kind of possibilities it's going yeah. to give us. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that because I also feel that the euro is a good consult for companies and what the regulators. Is, uh, are now trying to do is solving the problem that you just explained from the, from the farm that the, the, all the money flows would be more green and would support the, the, the uh, sustainable world mm -hmm. and get the money out of the fossil fuels and blah blah blah. But the one thing that I've, I've been hearing from companies who have maybe made these biodiversity reports or programs for themselves is that uh, they are a little bit afraid of the the public tone of voice of uh, biodiversity. They are afraid that if we kind of make the announcement that we will try to uh, halt our biodiversity in, in effects, or we will do this and this for the nature or the biodiversity, and then somebody can say, "Well, that's a, that 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 that's not enough," or you are not solving the correct problem, sort of. And why it's always so negative? Connotation of this biodiversity discussion in Finland, I I feel like it, uh, and not the positive one, because it could mm -hmm. be also that one. Or do you feel the same? Yeah, and that's interesting that unless you are perfect, you are not allowed to do anything. Yeah. So so if we want to change our behavior towards for green, we should all be vegan and not have cars and buy only recycled. It's not enough to do just one thing. Whereas if you actually think about it, doing even one thing is of course better than not doing And That's a very interesting uh, sort of issue that we have we have have here. Mm. But yeah, I think Sakari has been waiting for his turn for quite some time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm just thinking like if the discussion already led to somewhere. Else. <laughs> but I, I, I think maybe I, I'm really happy that Sakari, I think it, you, you started with the consumption. So I think that's really, really critical that we are not only speaking about the, the demands uh, or the supply side, but also the, the, the demand side, because if there is uh, only like very strict regulations on the, on the supply side of things, then it might lead to unoptimal solutions then in the in the marketplace. So there really has to be a discussion on the on the on the consumption. So what we really want to consume, how much we want to con co consume stuff and, and, and uh, how, how they should be made up and, and which which raw materials, because yeah, if there is put a stiff rest uh, tough restriction on, on certain industry, it might lead into competitive advantage in the, in the marketplace for, for, yeah. for, for other yeah. industries. But that's again uh, a very good bridge back to the question, question of whose responsibility is it basically yeah. because the consumers uh, can't buy stuff that isn't at the short, uh, stores whereas yeah. uh, of course uh, producers they produce things that they think that somebody wants. So so how would we get is it regulation or voluntary actions or citizen actors what would be a way out of this loop of everybody sort of pushing the responsibility on to others how could we change it so that not only do we internalize the negative the, the environmental but we would internalize the responsibility as well what would need to what would need to change yeah Jared. well i think the first step is to really recognize it so I think before sort of one can take responsibility or um, sort of set an ambition level, if we're, if we're, if we're thinking about a company, um, I think having a clear understanding of sort of what, what you do and how it impacts, if we're talking about biodiversity, that's only one aspect, but of course biodiversity. Um, and I think looping back to the sort of regulatory side too, I think the EU regulations on CSRD is the first step actually to that because it's creating a baseline that all companies must disclose in a similar way. So at least in that sense, the lens is the same for uh, all companies. And I mean, of course, they're not perfect. Nothing yeah, is perfect, yeah. but it's a it's a good step in the first direction for then for people both within a company and then external stakeholders, maybe investors, to be able to see with more transparency some of these issues. And I think from from there, then the sort of discussion can be started, but in the current state where there's a lack of tra transparency, I don't think it's possible. Actually, yeah. Yeah, from 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 the societal side uh, to your to your question, um, I think we, as a society, could stop stop uh, funding uh, those environmentally harmful 
businesses, uh, according to the Ministry of um, Economy, I think uh, uh, we have like 3.5 billion euros worth of uh, harm, environmentally harmful uh, business farms, for example. And uh, it's 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 just um, I think it's uh, ridiculous that we are we are on the other hand we are uh, supporting environmentally harmful uh, activities and on the other hand we are uh, trying to restore ecosystem and such. So so I think like very first step towards uh, sustainability would be to like uh, change our funding system uh, to uh, appreciate uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, businesses, and, and and we could also um, change ta change um, some of those 3.5 billion euros uh, into like um, ecosystem restoration or nature protection or such. Yeah, we have finished with this story. This Hölmöläisten then paid on. I don't know. Maybe the Finnish no charity is smiling nicely. <laughs> it's a story about uh, <laughs> Hölmöläis, the story of silly people, and they had a two short a blanket and they were uh, freezing their toes and then somebody said well it's so long here it reaches up to your nose so why don't you cut a little bit from here and then sew it down there so you get warm toes well they did that but then suddenly they pulled it up and it repeated but you get the idea i'm sure all of all of, uh, all of us here are gonna do and it does seem that sometimes the regulation the government actually maybe it is because we have different ministries and we have different uh, levels of regulation. We have global level, we have EU level, national, uh, regional level, that we end up actually just prolonging the blanket of the, the herbalize. So, so do you see that, you gave a good example of it, do you see that, for example, when you're dealing with companies, that, that, that the aims of the regulation seem to be quite contradictory? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the very famous uh, problem for political decision makers. Mm -hmm. As has been said, the famous question is from the, from climate change is that uh, how to how do we do what we have to do and to be elected again? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah, continue. And and of course, these kind of decisions are are about values and uh, what what is it that we are uh, that we want to support and fund. And of course, it's it's not as simple as that. That, that we just cut down those 3.5 billion uh, billions of funding and just uh, change it somewhere else. But I, I think there needs to be some kind of a discussion how how we could do it more effectively. Mm. Yeah, I think from a company point of view, the the consistency of the legislation yeah. is actually quite important. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of you're faced with several demands and if they are conflicting it's quite hard to kind of then steer around those and so I will take an example from the packaging side for example where there's a lot of uh, there's uh, targets to, to reduce plastic there's targets to increase recyclability and these always even though both are good targets but they don't always go hand in hand mm -hmm. so then you need to kind of balance well which one do I choose and what is is for our company or what is what does the consumer expect and so on so so it's not always easy so i would emphasize their consistency and and now with a lot of initiatives there i think that's a challenge also for the legislators probably how to get that consistency in place yeah yeah but drafting a law is very difficult yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's always high hopes for the law and then when it's implemented oh yeah it happen, all the side effects or something that we just couldn't realize that yeah. would happen so yeah yeah Marilyn, you had it. yeah so your original question was about what what or who should change basically mm. otto talked already about the the values i wrote down um, attitudes so kind of we would need really to need to change the attitude that we wouldn't make the decision based on money not us as individuals when we choose that what kind of a i don't know yogurt we we select from from the uh, from the um, convenience store or or what kind of i don't know software we buy for our company and, and so on and then i had something else i do talk about the, the fear of the co companies i would like to come back to that mm -hmm. later on okay uh, but also kind of the regulations or um I'm also now uh, drawing the ball to, to you about the eco-labels. I know 
something about forest industry, so therefore I can give <laughs> examples from there. But uh, try to go to the the S market or whatever and try to buy a a tissue paper that wouldn't have an eco label on it. So it's kind of a good example that uh, if there is the will, we kind of can make uh, also good quality products, but still that they are um, good uh, environmental wise. So yeah. Maybe I continue, but not about the forest industry, but I, I, I want to share a really positive view. You mentioned about the attitude uh, change and I have two young kids. So you, you, you really see, I think it's not only from, from home, but from the, from the, mm -hmm. from the friends and, and from the kindergarten. So they, they really have that really environmental uh, sound mi mindset. For example, if I'm taking a long shower, I'm, I'm getting complaints from my seven year old daughter <laughs> that you, you shouldn't do that. That's not, that's not good for the environment. So it's really, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's taking time that like the ship that the shift happens, like the generational shift happens, but I, I'm really positive on, on, on that. But of course, we can't wait only that. We have to take actions much faster as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe I can make a, make a comment on there. Just something that actually that made me think of is, I think as the generational shift happens, companies are also kind of aware of that. And actually one of the extra drivers that maybe we left off before is that having a sound and uh, let's say robust approach to biodiversity is becoming more important to actually attract people so yes. people people want to also work for a company that uh you know is doing the right thing by the the environment and i think that will become sort of an additional driver to, to the to the ones that we that we that we spoke about before um especially as this sort of new generation also uh, grows up and starts moving into the workforce yes exactly that's, i think that's a that's a very good point which i didn't mention when i listed the stakeholders so really the the employees mm. so really because the company is as good as, as the employees mm. and really if you want to attract the best talent you, you have to have to also be like uh, envir environmental sound yes but i be also thinking and um is it so because uh i know also this Zalando generation <laughs> <laughs> and and uh and I think yesterday on, on news there was this uh, story of uh, teenagers who like to shop whatever from your home. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and then I was thinking, are, are they so much aware of the sustainable consumption and of consuming? And just a short, short story from yesterday because I had the challenge and privilege to visit uh, Santa Hamina, mm -hmm. which is the army. Uh, I don't know how to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> we had a very interesting day. The, the Defense Force of Finland to get to know what they're doing there and so on. And but the final thing was that the, this old soldier, old, now in, in pension, was there and show us the, all, all the Kasarmi there, other places and so on. And, just basic this army history and history of Finland and so on. Suddenly he just stopped there. And, but yeah, by the way, uh, I would like to know you look at the trees here. Uh, can, uh, can you, uh, what do you think of them? And then he explained that the trees in Santa Hamina are way older than in Nuuksia, although Nuuksia is a protected area and Santa Hamina isn't, but it's restricted from the public. So that's why, and the soldiers, they really, take care of the trees because they give shelter mm -hmm. and so on. And he explained all the little insects and uh, butterflies who are very uh, rare and only in Santhamina now because it's kind of intact area. Mm -hmm. And it was so natural how he explained everything. And I was like, whoa, I hadn't even realized it because he, he knew it. Uh, he knew the biology, biology and natural science. and. It was some one short section of the program. It was so naturally involved, and I was just thinking, well, it's not that difficult. Why don't you, why don't we have attitude diversity like he had? And I was kind of, I admired him because he sort of inner wisdom in him, and he just explained it. This is also one side of this area here to, to uh, appreciate the species and the nature we have here. That's kind of. Uh... You've been involved in in creating drafting laws and legislation and regulations, and I, I know you have been commenting on some some forest related rules. So, so uh, what kind of a process is it? Because I'm sure that the people who get involved have all the best intentions of doing things and, and listening to researchers and science, 
But then when it gets down to uh, business, it's it's not necessarily too clear. And then when we look at the numbers about the state of the environment, <laughs> even though we've had that legislation for decades, it seems that the impacts have not actually uh, in the big big picture have not been that good. So 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 uh, where should we start fixing the process of, of designing the regulation to implementing them to actually then having an impact on the environment as because now you know something it doesn't have the expected impact is it of the process or implementation or or uh, i think environment if you think back 50 years environment or regulation in finland there is success mm -hmm. we've taken maybe 20 40 30 years ago, uh, a lot of environmental permitting came and it started from the uh, industry and the bad waters and so mm -hmm. on. Then we had the permitting with the certain conditions, what you have to do in order to, and, and as we can see, uh, there are many problems solved, solved with, with the regulation. Yeah, but the water there doesn't stink, <laughs> yeah. for example. But obviously, we are having new problems mm. that we didn't know 30 years ago. We are start, only now start starting to, to know them better now. And now we are, like you said, regulation always is lower. And that's why I think that's the promising and positive scenario. Apart from regulation is that uh, private sector always runs faster. So if we get the financial flows to the right mm. and the reporting, uh, so maybe that's the solution and not the law side. Which one of you work first? I believe it was Oslo. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Commenting on on you, um, I I think uh, if you look back at thirty years ago uh, and compare it to nowadays, uh, today the problems are so much more complex, and uh, so are the solutions. And like in the nineties, there was still these uh, very very environmentally harm harmful practices. Uh, that we have been able to shut down, but nowadays it's just like little streams that all lead to leads to the problems that we are having today, and it's it's much more difficult to tackle those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I just want to echo those points and say, at least in my mind, the way that I think about regulation is it's never and it will never be finished. Like it will continue to evolve into the future and hopefully become more and more fit for purpose as it progresses. And I think it's interesting to make the comparison of where we are now as we start to really zoom in on, bi on biodiversity as it's obviously a globally, it's a massive priority and we need to do something and zoom in and figure out how can we fix this? Whereas we, we didn't even have the resolution of the problem, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe the research uh, sort of academia did, but it, it wasn't sort of integrated into business and sort of everyday work. So I think it's quite interesting to see how that progresses and also recognize that while the while the ambition level of, of, of certain uh, regulation can be quite high, it will only probably get higher as we move forward. And then if, what, once we're in the future and we're, lo and we're looking back, we'll look back on, 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 this, on the same way that we look back on regulation now and say, okay, that, that, the bar is there and we're now here. So it is this constant improvement. I think using that attitude rather than thinking about Oh, ne like now I'm in the worst time because it, because it's it's so difficult to sort of manage all of these things. I think it, it it's a, it's a change in attitude, maybe a shift in perspective, but it, it's an important one. Yeah, and what it seems seems like that there is clearly this uh, in our team there are biodiversity researchers, uh, for example, our Professor Ilari Saxerve, mm -hmm. who just listed five books. The first one in in 1986 that listed exactly the same problems that, that the current the the recent report by IPES. So essentially, 40 years at least, mm -hmm. all the same issues have been known, and the the future has unfolded exactly the way that it was predicted in 1986. Mm. But something clearly has happened now that it's not only the biologists and biodiversity researchers that know it, that it's it's clear we are here. Mm. So 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 it has started to change. But the question is that uh, if I understand it correctly, uh, there is a limited time frame in which we can 
uh, do the requisite changes. If we, if we, uh, there's research on the planetary boundaries so that, you know, these natural systems that once we cross a certain threshold, after that there will be changes that are irrevocable and uh, more that more harmful than beneficial for the human race. So, so, so it is a limited time frame. So, uh, how do you believe that this attitude change that has now started uh, in the select group of youngsters? There are others who buy stuff from normal. There are youngsters who who just <laughs> the water for, for showering. <laughs> Uh, there's changes also in the regulation, the processes, which so, uh, and in the companies, it is clearly something that is on the agenda and it's not something only for the public affairs to sort of make it look pretty, but it's something in the core strategy. So, so do you believe that we're, it's deep enough, this attitude change? Is, it, are we like, is it a good place to be and we can continue doing the way things we are, we hope that this gradually inches or or should we sort of amp up a little bit and if so who should do it? Yeah, Sara. Yeah, it was just more on a personal note. I think the the kind of what you mentioned, the future scenarios and doing this kind of what what will the future look like if we do this, if we don't do that, if we don't do anything, I think that could be a powerful tool because I think people it's maybe human for us not to or cling to the past and what we know and it's a bit scary what happens in the future and if that comes a bit more tangible then I would kind of hope that people would start to do or go and take actions towards the nice future that they see but as if we don't know it then it's a bit uh, intangible mm -hmm. but I yeah personally I'm a bit <laughs> concerned about if, if this is enough and, and we also see it on the consumer side in consumer research that there is a big value to action gap that people mm -hmm. want to do things they want to do good things they might want to buy sustainable products but in the end they are not doing that and I guess there's many reasons why that's happening they might not be able to recognize them they there are several kind of criteria that they need to consider when they are buying Stuff, but but yeah, uh, anything yeah. that can happen us uh, help us envision the future, what it would look like. Yeah. I, so I essentially, you can't wait for the consumers to buy no, the right stuff. No, you no, have no. to actually yes. keep doing the right yes. stuff, yes. not wait for the consumers. Yeah. So there's one responsibility taker here. <laughs> 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 yeah, also. Uh, no, I think that's where regulation, both hard and soft, uh, come into play mm -hmm. because of the uh, like the gap that you just yeah. just, just just described, and uh, because uh, people are. Uh, most people are willing to act for climate change and uh, and uh, protect nature and such, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, in my also in my own life it's 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 difficult to make it make the right choices, and uh, yeah, if, if we had more support for like in in terms of also education, but also in in like crisis and uh, and such that could maybe maybe lead us. Uh, and nudge us towards doing the right the right things. Yeah, yeah it's okay. Yeah, difficult to say what, what what what's enough. That's the that's the big question. But I I think uh, at least I'm a, I'm a believer. Like I I have to believe. Of course, like, there, there would be professional millions. believers. <laughs> there, there would be like millions of reasons to to get depressed. But at least that's not the solution to get yeah. depressed and, yeah, and, and and do nothing. So like you have to believe that there is solution. And 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 of course like there is millions of reasons that show that are not indicators that I'm going on the on the right direction right direction but I think there is also a positive side. Mm -hmm. there is issues and there is things that we can we can we can uh, we can fix fix topics and that's the, the the thing that makes me wake up in the in the morning and I think there is a solution and like I, I work for UP and we, we really want and we believe that we can be part of the solution mm -hmm. of course then always there's the big question what's enough like we are always setting the bar higher developing uh, ways to do things better but what's enough what, what's enough? Of course, then we have to work together and with the research community and, and really to understand what, what's what's enough. What, what's enough? And yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, if you if you try to combine the, the ecological, social, and, and and economical responsibility all that together and optimize it, then mm -hmm. what's the best way of, mm -hmm. of doing it? So. Yeah. Yeah. I I also well, I am I I want to be in the future optimistic mm -hmm. about this. And I remember a few cases when we were in Montreal because me. I was traveling to the biodiversity convention for the first time uh, and I heard there from the business and biodiversity day that 90% of private sector people 
were there for the first time ever. So it was a huge mm. difference when we think of mm. the COP mm. uh, for the climate size, where the businesses are there all around and they really can see the green growth and, and, and the uh, possibility for them to transform their business to, to climate neutral world. But the biodiversity is not there yet. And, and I think that's why we are not seeing it optimistically, but the private yet, but the, when, now when the private sector is coming more into it. So I think that's that's the hope because the the money is transferring mm -hmm. the business to greener. Yeah, yeah. Then Otto, Jarod and Marilena. Yeah, returning what uh, what what uh, Sakari has said, uh, I think uh, it's it's important to be like positive and uh, encouraging. Of course, uh, we should not um, allow like greenwashing and such, but I think uh, like uh, goodwill is a <laughs> is a great great starting point on on all sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my point echoes that actually, and it's sort of maybe going one step, I think, beyond optimism. And I think one important component is being brave because we're not in the position that we have an easy recipe of how to fix biodiversity. Companies aren't able, unfortunately, at this point to have a, a very clear framework that shows them exactly what must be done. But we don't have the time actually to wait for those to be in place, which puts us in this funny chicken and egg, like we have to be able to run before we can walk effectively. But I would say as sort of my my role as a consultant and sort of dealing with companies on this on this issue is you, you have to be brave because I think the leading companies are, are moving forward and sort of facing the, the natural uncertainty that exists. But as we've discussed, the benefits will exist then for those sort of leaders sort of rather than the laggards. So I think that would be my part is that there's an element of bravery to sort of take on the issue, recognize the, un the uncertainty, but also recognize this is the trend and it's better to be going with the trend than against it, of course. Yeah, um, I think it's it's too depressing to think that we wouldn't. We couldn't make any any like action anymore to to hold the, the development. Um, kind of I, I can't think like that. <laughs> I wouldn't get up in the morning from the bed um, then there was something about yeah what the action is kind of I'm repeating myself again uh, basically so we need we all need to take actions today uh, we need to take actions as as consumers but what would we buy uh, and also we would need to de then make uh, the change also in our workplaces and uh, if we are in the position then try to change the company ourselves or then try to influence our superiors and say that okay we would need to shift the focus of our company, for example. Um, if we have time, um, I would like to discuss about the, the topic of the, the company's fears of uh, how to approach this issue or are they kind of, is there, will there be a person saying that you are not doing enough or, yeah. can I con continue? Yes, <laughs> 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 this, this one. Um, I kind of, I agree with you, I kind of, um, I also have receive that kind of a feedback that, that companies, especially smaller smaller companies say that or they are uh, afraid of what they can say aloud because then there will be a, somebody saying that this is not enough or you are doing the wrong thing or, or whatever. Um, yeah, kind of. Um, I have been very positive about the forest industry, but but then again, I also think that I could be very uh, critical towards the forest industry or at least the, the, the biggest companies in Finland, because I know that they have the resources kind of, and they have the knowledge kind of, they know what to do. And in that case, also a researcher can be also critical towards them. But then I do realize that there are companies, especially the smaller ones that don't have that much knowledge on sustainability. And in that sense, I also kind of, I would like to encourage them that that, that start with, with small steps. It's yeah. fine mm -hmm. to say that I don't know, or I don't, um, that we don't know everything of this topic. Mm -hmm. I especially like the, the first round table what we had in, in our, our project. Uh, and I felt that the companies were like um, open about it, that they see that biodiversity is a very important issue, but we don't have the solution yet, but kind of we want to learn. And that's kind of the attitude that what I'm, I'm looking for from the company is that they can say that they don't know everything, but they are uh, willing to start with slow steps. If a forest industry, a big forest industry company would say that, okay, we will take now this, this minor step and this is very good for us, then I would be very critical towards those because I know that you have a very long tradition in environmental issues. You have been doing a lot. Therefore, I also ask more from you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And of course, we are not yeah. claiming that we know everything, that we are we yeah. are there and everything's perfect. Of yeah. course, like there is things that we still have to focus on and develop. There is a lot of things to, to that needs to be taking taking further. Of course, that's 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 obvious. Mm. Maybe I could just jump in on there, and I think it's if we tie it back to sort of the practical implementation of many of these new policies, at least from the way that it's coming in the EU, is it, it is the biggest companies that are sort of given the burden of yeah. figuring out actually how to how to address this. So it, in that way, it's 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 sort of neat for the smaller ones that may not have the resources to be able to address some of these new issues. And the way that it's structured is so that those bigger companies can be the leaders sure. and then sort of, you know, bring sort of pave pave the way if you if you if, if you will for some of the smaller ones to follow that that can't do it as the first wave yeah and kind of give it the resources or for also for the suppliers for example mm. yeah exactly i'm yeah. happy you mentioned suppliers because i was just yeah. about to mention the value chain this is yeah. somehow how we can can track yeah. the mm -hmm. other companies with us because big corporations for example UPM, UPM has more than twenty thousand suppliers in the first year and if you think the whole supply chain there's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of companies of course like there is a huge leverage that we can mm -hmm. it's it's really complicated of course like mm -hmm. it's much easier to develop our own operations which is under our own full yeah. control yeah but then the suppliers sometimes we have a leverage sometimes we don't uh, of course like it's a huge job for all, all the big corporations to 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 uh, let's say meet the challenges in the in the supply chain but we are really working hard on, on that front as well yeah uh no it's i think it's time for the last question which i think that will go go around this and um, I think it, it's clear that this issue is very complex, uh, the, the boundary between what is voluntary and what is and what should be regulated and uh, uh, what, what should whoever do, what should the consumers or the companies or the decision makers do. Uh, but let's say that you would now not need to think about any limitations or any restrictions of any decision, decisions. Uh, could you create one sort of rule or regulation that everybody should, in in your view, sort of uh, adhere to, and that would make things better. What what is something that would be the kind of the minimum thing that all companies, or you can choose that rule that pertains to cost the consumers, or rule to, that pertains to companies. So so what is something if, that everybody should? Uh, what would you like to force everybody do? Let's. I know this is not a very good thing to do. It would be more pro freedom and voluntarity, but, but I think that this way we might get something concrete. What is something that you would like to force somebody to do if you had the power? Yeah, Marilena. Um, if I had the power, I would like that Finland would have like a nature law in comparison to the climate law that says that, that Finland is, is going to be um, carbon neutral in 2035. So similar system for the biodiversity that would have a uh, target in the law saying that we are going to be nature positive in 2035. Yeah, okay. So national level Finnish yeah. law, that's yeah. good ambition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think you know, we need a regulatory framework uh, to put the environmental harm and uh, cost of externalities in the, into the commodities. Um, plus, like, like said before, we need, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, all kinds of measuring and stuff, but yeah, overall, that. So one. if you do harm, if you do harm to the environment, it means that whatever you're selling is will be more expensive. Yes. So it's directly in the prices. Yes, that's a good another magic wand solution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was about to say that, that the same. <laughs> like I know, like it doesn't exist. It's not possible currently. But in the in the dream world, like there there shouldn't mm -hmm. be no limitations. So if if like all the costs or all the impacts would be baked in the price of the product. Then it would be clear, like in the in the marketplace, mm -hmm. what's what's the best product? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, really good. Who wants to go next? Yeah, Sara. Yeah, I would actually start from kind of what everyone should do, and from a company point of view, I I guess we have the framework already upcoming for that. Is that to start looking at your impact, identify the impacts and and risks, and where you have a positive impact, where you have a negative impact, and start to act on those towards the goals that have been agreed in Montreal. So. Yeah, it should be mandatory to understand the impacts. I'm not sure is it now. I'm sure it's by by many different. It's but, coming. But very, life. very. It's clear in your industries, but they can ICT company, for example. Mm -hmm. They yeah. probably have no idea how they are. So, but that's a very good one that everybody should be aware. Mm -hmm. It should be mandatory to be aware of their environmental impacts. Very. Yeah, good. and deforestation law is kind of a. 
yes, it's yes. in this way because yeah, yeah. yeah. And please join the work related to the science-based target network. That's one of that's the first step of the yeah. of the methodology to understand your assess your own impact. Yeah, yeah. that's how we're going there. Now we're doing what are we supposed to do? Then Minna. I had the similar kind of answer than you. I was thinking that if I could decide, I would hope the Daskutter report would be implemented so we have the nature have the price so if we go up into our economic system. Yeah, all the worms. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <Killing. laughs> it comes with would the be expensive to kill a worm. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and that would be right. Yeah, Tara. Yeah, I can maybe just just sort of wrap up and and sort of wish if I could make one regulatory wish, it, it would be to be able to plug the sort of holes that then happen also sort of outside of the scope of the laws that we're looking at. So mm -hmm. we obviously talk about the EU a lot. But it would be, of course, amazing if the global biodiversity framework could somehow potentially tra transform into a into some sort of a binding binding sort of commitment. There, I'm not I'm not too hopeful on on that front. But I think as a sort of a high level dream, high level dream, it could be it could be something really quite amazing. All countries would be involved, like US, <laughs> India, China would join. <laughs> exactly. So I think that would be my my dream. Yeah, and I think that that would also. Uh, uh, because the one quick key issue is also equality, because biodiversity issues and global e equality issues they go hand in hand. Mm. So your solution would also fix the equality, because mm. not only would we pay for the worm we kill here in Finland, but we would also pay for the worms or flies or whatever they are in in Southeast Asia. Yeah. <laughs> so 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 to bring that on on the level. Mm. Hopefully the AI can can someday provide an AB quantifying the warm all the warms in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But thank you all for the very interesting discussion. Uh, it was regulation, but it was I think quite a lot of other things as well. Mm. I hope you all felt that you got something out of it and I also hope that all of you there, let's give them a wave. <laughs> <Yeah. out. laughs> I'm sure they are. Nothing better to do than to listen to us. Uh, this will be online eventually through mm. EY and also through our website. So, so uh, if you have a friend who should definitely listen to this, then just <laughs> it's not the it was not lost the chance to hear our stop. Thank you very much all the discussions and thank you very much there and enjoy the spring. Bye bye. Bye.